Imagine your favorite public space. Maybe it's a park, or a square, or your neighborhood street. What is it that makes it great? There's most likely a place to sit and rest and watch the world go by. There's probably some form of shelter from the sun and the rain. Maybe there's other people, families with young children, an elderly couple out for a stroll. Now imagine the opposite. A public space that you dislike. For me, this is Young and Dundas Square in Toronto, our version of New York's Times Square. Lined with video screens and bright lights, it's not really a place that I want to stop and linger. It can be pretty disorienting. And even if I did, the benches that are there look more like abstract art than a place to sit. All around us, design shapes how we experience the city. Some features are meant to guide us, provide amenity, or keep us safe. While others are meant to exclude. What looks to be a form of medieval torture is actually an example of defensive urban design. Also known as hostile, unpleasant, or exclusive architecture, it's used to guide or restrict behavior in urban space as a form of crime prevention or protection of property. It's an intentional design strategy that targets people who use or rely on public spaces more than others, like people who are homeless and youth. And it does this by targeting the behaviors they engage in. Not only does it limit possible activities, it conveys messages like, who belongs here? And who is welcome in this space? Over the past three years, I've been studying defensive urban design in Toronto, Canada's largest and most populous city. What started as research while I was a planning student at York University turned into Defensive TO, an online project that documents its various forms. Taking Toronto as a starting point and expanding to other cities, Defensive TO works to uncover hidden design strategies that are meant to exclude. Forms of defensive design vary depending on the behavior it's designed to restrict. Drawing from hundreds of photos I've taken in Europe and North America, I've tried to categorize its most common forms. Modified seating is the most visible form of defensive design. Benches with a center bar are designed to keep homeless people from sleeping on them. And seating without backrests are meant to keep people from lingering for too long. Ledges are also targeted because they attract unwanted behaviors like skateboarding or loitering. They can be adapted with metal objects called caps or pig's ears. Or they can be specially designed with varying angles to keep people from skateboarding or lying down. Barriers can be temporary or permanent and are used to restrict access to urban space. Examples include rocks placed underneath an overpass to keep people from seeking refuge, or planter boxes that are placed strategically to keep people from skateboarding along a ledge. Surface treatments also transform how we interact with the city. 
objects can be embedded into surfaces to keep people off. And in Toronto, utility poles are wrapped in a special material that prevents postering. Light can be used to increase visibility and safety in a space, but it can also be used as a deterrent depending on its brightness and quality. Blue lights are used in washrooms to prevent drug users from finding a vein. And in the UK, pink lights are used to amplify the acne and resulting social discomfort of loitering youth. Sound is also used to target youth. An anti-loitering device called the mosquito emits an irritating, high-pitched sound that only young people can hear. And this device was actually used in a Toronto park a few years ago, and it was located close to nearby youth shelter. But after it made media headlines, they decided to remove it. And finally, surveillance cameras are commonplace in cities around the world. But as technology advances, forms change. Recently, in San Francisco, an anti-homeless robot was spotted patrolling the space outside of an animal shelter, which was also the location of a homeless camp. This 400-pound robot on wheels was used to read license plates and record security footage until the city ordered it to stay off public sidewalks or face daily fines. Not only can defensive elements be added to a space, objects or amenities can be removed, and this removes certain functions. This is what I call ghost amenities. These are public amenities like washrooms, water fountains, and benches that should be included in public spaces to make them more hospitable, but are not as a way to reduce costs or to prevent vandalism or misuse. And although this design strategy isn't discussed as much as others, it's often easier to remove an element than it is to alter it. Or to construct something new. While defensive design is pervasive, it's often hidden in plain sight. Implicit forms are largely invisible to everyday users, and this is because its coercive functions are hidden within more socially acceptable ones, like a bench designed to keep people from lying down. Still allows for the function of sitting. Only when it becomes explicit do people take notice. Last spring, curved metal bars were installed on top of a grate outside of a downtown Toronto hospital. The bars provoked outrage by the community because it was explicit in its target, function, and message. Its target was people who were homeless. Its function was to keep them from lying on top of the warm grate, and its message was, "You are not welcome here." After much public pressure, the hospital apologized and removed the offending structure. Whether implicit or explicit. Defensive design is a form of urban censorship. Who we see in our public spaces informs our idea of who is a part of the public. When we use design to address social issues like homelessness, substance use, or mental illness, it merely displaces the problem rather than confronting it. This creates a distorted version of the city, free from poverty and social discomfort. And this is a problem, because it is through our encounters of difference and experiencing the other that we learn different values, forms of expression, 
and the unknown becomes known. Not only does defensive design target so-called undesirable users, it also makes public space inaccessible for others, for people who are blind or hard of seeing. Defensive elements can be a hazard if they're accidentally tripped on or sat on, and for people who are elderly or have a disability. The lack of public amenities like benches and washrooms makes navigating public space difficult or impossible. Rather than using design to exclude, we should be using design to bring people together. And this starts with recognizing that everyone should have the right to access the benefits of public space. In Montreal, when the city decided to redesign a city center park, home to a number of substance users and people who are homeless, rather than using design to displace, they decided to bring people together by making the park a focal point for social services. While it may seem like defensive design is everywhere, it doesn't have to be this way. We can all advocate for more inclusive public spaces. You can go to a neighborhood planning meeting or contact your local politician. You can start a social media campaign or link into one that already exists. From New York to LA, people are documenting defensive design under the hashtag hostile design. And in France, homeless charities have started an online campaign and mapping project under the hashtag soyons humains, which means let's be human. In order to create a truly inclusive city, we must not shy away from difference in our public spaces. Everyone deserves to have a place in their city. And everyone should have the right to access the benefits of public space. Thank you.